Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. The reopening of many businesses up north has the rest of the state wondering which region will be next. We'll see what the governor's new map tells us. Paula. Parents are desperately trying to figure out how to make plans for the reopening of school. Well, we have details on how Tri-County superintendents are working together to give you that plan. Okay, Paula, and he was already in the fight of his life. Then the hill got even steeper. A local cancer patient is on a mission to give himself more time, pandemic or no pandemic. Thanks for being with us here at 6 as we continue to track the impact of coronavirus locally and statewide. Yeah, Michigan reporting 435 new cases of the virus and 102 more lives lost, pushing the state's death total now to over 5,000. President Trump plans to visit Ford's Rossonville plant in Ypsilanti Thursday, raising questions of whether he'll be required to wear a mask. Ford put out a statement saying their policy is that everyone wears PPE, but the White House will ultimately make its own determination. Now, if you're registered to vote in Michigan, you can expect to get an application in the mail giving you the option to vote by mail. That would be for both the August primaries and the November general election, which of course includes the presidential election. Well, when it comes to reopening Michigan, school is top of mind for many, many families. Yeah, some school districts are revealing preliminary plans to restart school in late summer. West Bloomfield announced today kind of a hybrid model of remote and in-person learning that will begin August 26th. In the meantime, top education administrators are also working together to create a playbook to help guide their districts. As Paula Tutman explains, all plans are still in flux. The phrase we're all in it together is amplified by the work the three county superintendents are doing to figure out a playbook to reopen schools. We're preparing right now for every different scenario that there could be. We're looking at the best research everywhere across the country in regards to ideas about how to do it in each of those scenarios. And then school districts make their own individual decisions about what are the best practices that make the most sense for them in their community. The county superintendent's offices of Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne are meeting regularly to figure out best practices to recommend to the governor's office. Right now, there are four basic frameworks. A traditional reopening in the fall, not likely. A remote opening. Rolling closures that would respond to individual school districts should there be an outbreak so that all districts aren't affected. And then I have something called the hybrid opening. And you see a lot of models around America on that. We've got like 10 options on here. Everything from every other day to rotation to uh, just going with elementary and the remote secondary, all those teasing those out. And there's a hefty cost, finding students lost in remote learning, accommodating students afraid to attend in-person classes, more staff needed to teach hybrid models, more staff needed to clean facilities. And should masks be needed, for instance, that bulk purchase alone at even a dollar fifty cents per mask would be more than a million dollars per county. Before we do anything, it's always in the context of waiting for guidance from the uh, 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 medical and the, and, the, and the health officials. Likely, no matter what, school will look different come fall. And parents get it. No one has any idea, if we're being honest, where we're going to land in September. We have no idea, or August. So I think, you know, you've got to have plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, you've got to have 25 plans. And, you know, just when the time comes, you go in the best route and you do the best with what you're given. Paula Tutman, Local 4. And those superintendents believe they'll have their basic framework ready to reveal sometime after yeah. July 4th. Now this Friday, up north Michigan opens for the season. The governor allowing restaurants and retail to go back into business. Governor's advisory committee has drawn up a map of the state and it is the guide on how the whole state now moves forward. Rod Maloney live with us now with a closer look at the map, how it works and where Metro Detroit fits in, Rod. Well, David, you know, uh, this uh, map was rolled out about two, three weeks ago now. The governor didn't press it into use until yesterday. And yes, there are those questions about its construct and what it means to us here in Metro Detroit. 
The map splits Michigan into eight different regions, comes from the governor's Michigan Economic Council. They've told us they considered areas where Michiganders travel to and from work, the virus's severity there, and local hospital system readiness. About a week after rolling out the map, the governor then put out this color-coded chart explaining the six phases for reopening. The two colors in play right now are orange for flattening and yellow for improving. Starting on Friday, the entire UP and the 17 counties making up Region 6 will reopen to retail and allow restaurants to operate at half capacity using social distancing. That accounts for 32 of the state's 83 counties. The rest of the state, 51 counties, remains in the orange or flattening phase. We in Metro Detroit are in Region 1, which contains nine counties, Monroe, Wayne, Macomb, St. Clair, Washtenaw, Oakland, Lapeer, Livingston, and Genesee. Getting open again here depends on three things, lower case numbers per million, downward trends in new daily cases, and the number of positive tests. The governor says testing is perhaps most important. Ultimately, we do want to get everyone tested. At this point in time, what we're focusing on is, you know, if you are someone who is a grocery store clerk or a utility worker or a daycare center worker or any of the other um, people that have been at work or are going back to work, get tested. Well, it looks like there's a test in all of our futures. Now, I asked the governor uh, if, in fact, she could give us even a, a hint as to which region might be getting closer to possibly reopening. And she said pretty much the entire section of southern Michigan is about at the same level, and she wasn't going to be giving up any hints. She's going to be back on camera tomorrow. We'll be asking her then. Reporting live, Rod Maloney, Local 4. Yep. All right, Rod. Uh, well, it's been a real mess outside for much of the day. We're seeing a little bit of sunshine now, but uh, we've seen flooding in some areas and four live radar still shows some green there on the map. Ben, that could uh, mean more trouble, right? Yeah, especially with those east winds, uh, Kim and Devin, that's the thing that we need to calm down. The rain is pretty much gone except for the very southern end of our south zone. Here's a look at four live radar and you can see where the northern extent of that is just creeping up under the uh, state line. So generally we expect conditions to improve as we get through the nighttime hours as far as the rain goes, but we are still stuck with those east winds through the day tomorrow. Now the lakeshore flood warnings uh, run until 10 o'clock tonight uh, as we expect the speeds to decrease overnight. So we'll have to watch and see what happens as we get into tomorrow. But that Macomb County warning did get extended, was supposed to expire at 4 p.m. today. River Rouge has crested. It's about a foot and a half above flood stage, should drop below by midnight tonight. But there is a river flood warning out there right now. Temperatures close to 70 as we speak. We'll be down into the low 60s at midnight tonight as those showers come to an end. But coming up, we are going to be taking a look at your holiday weekend forecast. If you want a sneak peek, check the local forecasters app. You can watch the rain move out and the 80s move in and find out how long they'll be with us. We'll give you the answer to that coming up in just a few minutes, guys. And just showed us the rain and the wind, and we already know that already high lake levels have been a recipe for flooding in a number of parts of Metro Detroit. It's been particularly bad in places like Luna Pier and LaSalle, and that's where we find Grant Herms with a look at how people there are coping. Grant. Well, Devin, that rain in the last couple of days certainly didn't help anybody here, but it was those 50 to 20 mile per hour winds that we just heard Ben talking about that's been sending these waves crashing over the break walls. Even as late as right now, you just saw some of that, all that water crashing into yards and homes here. So I've been out here in this neighborhood since I've been 12 and I'm going to be 70. Butch Ewell has lived along Lake Erie his entire life and is no stranger to the ins and outs of flooding along the shoreline, which is why he was out today feeding the birds. You know, it takes your mind off the rest of this, you know, picking up the yard. You know, you just got to keep picking back up and going over again. And there was quite a bit to pick up. Recent high winds and waves crashing over his break. Butch was up all night wading through 16 inches of water. I was out here 12 o'clock last night chasing my garbage cans and, and whatever else is floating away on me. While Butch says he's seen it all, the Army Corps of Engineers might say otherwise, saying the lake is now at a record-setting level, which is expected to stay that way for some time. It's pretty hot. Yeah. These waves aren't hitting the break wall. They're slurping over the top of them. You guys probably suck. Yeah. yeah, it's scary. But despite that, Butch says he can handle anything the lake throws at him. And if not... He's got a backup plan in the driveway. Put the boat back here just in case uh, things really get tough and I got to run out to my boat and get away. 
Well, the State Department of the Environment is very concerned about these high lake levels, not just here on Lake Erie, but across lakes across the state. And what that means for erosion, they see it's a problem for all Michiganders without any end in sight. In LaSalle, Grant Terms, Local 4. Yeah. All right, Grant. Well, imagine you're already fighting for your life and a world pandemic hits. That's a situation many cancer patients suddenly found themselves in with the coronavirus effectively eliminating certain treatment options. Dr. Frank McGeorge joins us with the story of one local man determined to find a way, Doc. Yeah, Kim, as the coronavirus spread, some cancer centers stopped enrolling patients in clinical trials. A crushing blow for people that are hoping to try experimental therapies to extend their lives. But one Canton man simply would not take no for an answer. 50-year-old Jing Song Mo has stage 4 pancreatic cancer. I was pretty devastated, uh, to be honest, because uh, here I was, uh, out of chemo, and there is no other treatment available. Standard treatments worked well for two years, but the cancer came back just as coronavirus started to spread. He unfortunately was faced with two institutions um, where he'd been getting his care that had closed their facilities to new enrollment on clinical trials. Mo searched for a clinical trial still accepting patients despite COVID-19, and he found one two and a half hours away at the Cleveland Clinic. I was looking for uh, anything that could help me, and uh, for a patient like my situation, all I can ask for is, what I can pray for is a little bit of hope. Every week, Mo travels from Canton to Cleveland for an experimental immunotherapy infusion. It'll be weeks before doctors know if the therapy is working, but the chance to keep fighting keeps Mo going. In this case, uh, having the opportunity to try it, um, to me, is, was uh, pretty uplifting. Now, Dr. Shepard encourages people with advanced cancers to be persistent when seeking treatment options, regardless of COVID-19. And hopefully, many of those clinical trials will be reopening soon. So what is, what is the state of affairs now for people who've had their treatment or surgeries delayed by this? Well, you know, it varies by hospital. More and more surgeries are being done, but obviously there's quite a backlog. You really need to call your doctor, and if anything has changed, make sure they know that. Things that were not considered urgent two months ago, well, they may be urgent now. Yeah. Back to you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Doc. Well, the pandemic has brought with it uncertain times, but we know it has also shown us that we are Metro Detroit strong. We hope you'll join us for our Spirit of Detroit special tomorrow night at 8. See how your neighbors are showing up for each other with acts of kindness, generosity, and bravery. We'll also have a special tribute to the class of 2020. That's tomorrow at 8 p.m. Ahead for us, a small business checkup from Help Me Hank. Some businesses here in Metro Detroit are suffering because of COVID-19. Others, as you will see, are booming. I'm Hank Winchester. Help me, Hank. That's story tonight. When the going gets tough, Metro Detroiters always rise to the challenge. Now meet the heroes that truly embody the spirit of Detroit. A special event, Wednesday at 8 on Local 4.